Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Go ahead and open your Bibles to the 13th chapter of the book of Romans. And somebody run back by that heat here and in the foyer. I mean, the, the one on the other side over there in the hallway. Glory to God. We're in the 13th chapter of the book of Romans. Talk about the life and writings of Paul. And um, we're, we're, we're getting closer. When Rome, we get down with Romans, we get to shorter books. Everything drops off dramatically in length. And uh, so uh, we've, we've covered 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Romans. Those are the those are the three longest books. Of course, we did First and Second Thessalonians first because those were the chronological order that Paul wrote in. Hallelujah. And then, of course, we were going through the book of Acts, finding out where Paul was. He's over in Macedonia writing this letter. He's been there for about four months now because that's how long it's been taking us to get through it. So I'm guessing Paul might not have written, taken that long to write it, but that's how long it's taken us to go through it. Hallelujah. Um, so Paul starts out. Now, listen, remember... Uh, Chapters 1 through uh, 8 were doctrinal chapters. 9, 10, and 11 were uh, things in relation to the Jews and, and, and so forth. And then he gets back into 12 um, and begins to give practical application of, of, the, of doctrine and of the Word of God. And uh, so we've gotten through 12. Now it's 13. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be, that be are ordained of God. Whoso resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works. Now, in other words, if, you're doing wrong, if you ain't doing wrong, then they're not a terror to you. Now, well, listen, let's just set this aside. There's always, you can always have a corrupt person, all right? But the, power, the, the office they stand in was, not, was ordained of God, all right? All um, right. The, the, the rules are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then be afraid of the power? Do, uh, do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. In other words, we're to obey the law. You can't go, well, I don't like them, so I'm just going to go do whatever I want to. You can't do that. Now, let me say this. If you're, if you're, how many of you have ever been riding down the road and you're doing the speed limit? You always do the speed limit, and you see a cop. You don't slam on brakes if you're always doing the speed limit. Now, if you're always running and fudging a little bit, I'm not even going to ask who in here fudges it a little bit. All right? But if you're always fudging a little bit, you're going five to seven miles over all the time, and you see a cop, what do you do? <laughs> Why? Because, you know, you hope you're not the fish of the day. Amen. Now, if, if you're speeding long, you go by him and he doesn't come after you, he's looking for a bigger fish. All right. How many of you have ever gone by and you looked down and you were doing 50 and a 35 or, 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 you know, 57 and a 45 and he didn't get after you? You know why? He's waiting for the guy doing 65. Okay. He's looking for a bigger fish. All right. But if you're not, if you're not doing anything wrong, you don't have to be afraid. Amen. Um. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. He beareth not the sword in vain. He is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now, you know, we get people all the time, you know, they go break the law, and then, they, then the, and the cops come after them, and something happens. And, uh, you know, oh, you know, this, this is a problem. You know, there's some kid recently stole a motorcycle and came by police doing uh, like 75 on a motorcycle in town. He peeled around. To go after him, as soon as he peeled around, the guy sped it up even more. Went over 100, had a wreck, and got killed. Now the family's suing the police officer, for, police officer for pursuing him. Now that's not right. That's, that's not what the Bible tells us to do. You know, you get churches all together, they'll start you know, protesting the police department because they, they, they pursued somebody and they got killed. Or, you know, look, um, and I, I'm not going to get real political, but the kid, the, the, you know, supposed kid, the kid, the guy was six something, 300 pounds almost. The guy, the guy out in Ferguson, Missouri, he had, they had him on video stealing from, robbing a store. They were looking for him. Now, the police weren't profiling him. He fit the description of the guy who just robbed some guy's store. Now, everybody's upset that he got killed. Well, if he hadn't have done any of the th stuff he'd done, he wouldn't, have any, he wouldn't have been in trouble to begin with. 
You don't rob stores, you don't get pursued. Hello? And if you don't attack cops, you don't get shot. So anyway, you know, th this is right here. The, the, we are to do the word of God. Now look, if, if you've done something wrong, just stop and raise your hand and say, I, I, I got caught, <laughs> you know. We're always looking for somebody to get us out of whatever it was we were doing and, and not doing what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to do what we're supposed to do. Isn't that right? Okay? We're to be subject. We're not to, not to, uh, and then listen, they are there to execute wrath and vengeance upon those who break the law. That's their job. I, 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 taught, I was uh, getting Nathan's uh, windshield. He got hit by a rock, and it, it, I mean, it just right across the windshield. And uh, so I was down at the, the glass repair place, and one of the, the Greensboro City police were there. He's getting something done on one of his windshields, and he was, we just got to talking and, and carrying on and discussing. He said they are no longer allowed to pursue people unless they can pr prove or have a valid reason that they're an imminent threat to society. So somebody, if they see somebody come by 80 miles an hour downtown, they can't pursue them. It's again, they, 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 the, Greensboro, the Greensboro Police Department has issued them. They cannot pursue. And if they do, they've got to be able to prove a good, valid reason why they went after them. And the guy told me, he said, it's the stupidest thing in the world. He said, you don't know how many people we've caught. They had arrest warrants and whatever from other states, murder and all kinds of stuff, because we went after them and got them for, for speeding or something. And pull up the stuff, and all of a sudden we find out that they're wanted in New Jersey for murder. All right? So... We, we as Christians, hello, should be walking in accordance with the law. And, we, and listen, that police officer, I mean, how many grew up in the, if you grew up in the 70s, remember they used to call them pigs and oinkers and all this kind of stuff. You know, fuzz. It, it the big thing was in the, 70s, in the hippie movement, it was the, it was the uh, pigs and oinkers. You know, back in the 50s, they were the coppers, you know. Um, and, and, you know, snort at them and all this kind of stuff. Listen, they're, they're doing a job. And I'm telling you, if somebody's breaking in your house and trying to do, hurt you or rob you, the first person you want to show up is the police. So let's, let's give respect and honor to the powers that be. Amen? All right. Um, and then he goes on, for, for this cause, pay ye tribute. Now, the word tribute can mean taxes. For they are the ministers att uh, attending continually upon this thing. Render therefore all to their due. Tax to whom tax or tribute to whom tribute. Custom or revenue. To whom revenue, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor, owe no man anything but to love one another. And Paul's getting ready to transition from talking about obeying government or civil officials into we're talking about love. All right? Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now you've got a lot of people who will stop right there and don't read on. For this, Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, wow, how many of you have ever heard that there's only one commandment? How many of you heard people teach there's only one commandment? The commandment of love. Isn't it amazing? And I've ever caught quotes to quote Paul, the grace preacher. And the only commandment is the commandment of love because we're under grace. He just listed uh, adultery, kill, steal, bear false witness, covet. He just listed what? One, two, three, four. And it says, and if there be any other commandment. In other words, he's saying there's something, you know, he listed four and said any other commandment. In other words, he's saying there's more than one commandment. But you got people say, oh, there's only the commandment of love. You got to read the whole Bible and take the whole Bible, and you just can't just pull a section or a scripture out and build everything on that. You got to build it on the whole. If you don't, you're going to skew everything. Let me say this if you went downtown and got a blueprint, hello, say you got the skeletal blueprint of a building, you didn't get the blueprint for the, the walls and the glass and all the interior walls. You just got the skeletal blueprint and went and built that. Guess what? You wouldn't have a complete building. Now, you would have what that blueprint said, but you didn't have the whole. Because there were blueprints for the electric. There were blueprints for the, um, for the plumbing. There was blueprints for the, for the gas lines, which goes under the plumbing. Okay, the HVAC. Okay, you're going to get, because uh, so, most plumbers are, are licensed to put in gas lines and, and water lines, okay? And um, so you got the blueprint for the plumbing, you got the blueprint for the gas, you got the blueprint for the glass, you got the blueprint for the interior walls, you got the blueprint for uh, all the circuits, you've got the blueprints for the elevators. But if you only get one of all those blueprints and go build, you can't say I'm done. I got, I got the whole. You have the part that you had the blueprint for, but it's not the whole. Because see, that blueprint was a part of a package. 
And all of those things together created the whole. You understand what I'm saying? And you know, until you have all of them and all of them completed, you don't have the whole. So to take one little passage of Scripture out and go and build that and say, that's all there is to it, is not accurate. Because the Bible is the whole. And so you have to take all of it to get all the parts together so that you have the whole picture. And, you know, and if you uh, know anything about construction, or particularly on, on large projects, they'll do, they'll, they'll do scale size models of their finished product, what they want. Now, if you get the blueprint for the structure and go build that and don't have all the other stuff, you go show it and put it against the, uh, the, the, uh, the model, it ain't going to look like it. It might have a form of it, but it's not the complete of it. All right? Oh, they'll put little people down there and little cars and bushes. Oh, they'll do the whole thing. You know? I mean, they go all out. I mean, they might spend thousands of dollars on the, the, the mock-up. But it's not, you know, that's just a mock-up. For the Bible is our picture. And it's the whole that we build on. So if you're building on, there's only the company, John, because John says this is his commandment, that we love one another as he loved us. And people run off and say, oh, that's all there is. It's the law. It's just love one another. You know, like John, you know. But Paul says there's, there's, don't commit adultery, don't kill, don't steal, don't, false, uh, don't bear false witness, don't covet. He's saying that. And he says, and if there is any other commandment, or in other words, He's, he's saying that, that everything will be wrapped up in the law of love. But the law of, you know, he still said that not committing adultery is still the law of God. Or a command of God. He quoted it right here. You got people running around saying, we don't do any of the Old Testament commandments, we just walk in love. Paul just quoted it right here and said it's a commandment. All right? Um, it's briefly, and listen to this, he said briefly, comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Isn't that interesting? He said briefly comp uh, comprehended. He's saying this is just a, uh, and, and that, don't misquote, misunderstand what I'm saying here. It's a shallow overview of everything else. In other words, there's more depth to it than just kind of going around saying love people. And then he goes on and says this, love works no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is fulfilling the fulfilling of the law. What's that mean? That if I love my neighbor, I will not commit adultery with his wife. If I love my neighbor, so now it's still wrong to commit adultery. That's still a commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. But if I walk in love and I, and, and I love my neighbor, I'm not going to violate that law of committing adultery. If I love my neighbor, I'm not going to steal from him. If I love my neighbor, I'm not going to bear false witness against him. If I love my neighbor, I'm not going to covet what he has. Amen. So Paul said it's briefly comprehended. And notice he didn't even call it a law. He said a commandment. I mean, I, 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 he didn't say it was a commandment. He said it was a saying. Now, I'm not saying walking in love is a saying. It is a command. I'm just saying we put so, people say certain things and they kind of, you know, um, relinquish themselves from having to obey anything else. They say, well, I love, you know, I just, I just walk in love. And, and, and they're not walking in love because they're violating all kinds of stuff when they're doing what they're doing. But they say they can get away with it because they're under the law of love and under grace and they don't have to obey any of the other stuff. Well, you do have to obey the other stuff. I, I said this, I've said this before. God's moral code is still God's moral code. And the, the Old Testament law was simply a, a, a delineation or, or an, a, a, an expository on the law, moral code of God that God demands of humans to stand in his presence. Man couldn't do it, not without the new birth and without the regeneration of the spirit and without the life of God on the inside of him and then him walking in accordance with the law of God. He can walk in a power that per permits him to not commit adultery and be free from this present world that, that the dictates of the flesh demanded he violate God's law. Remember we said Sunday that the Bible says the carnal mind is enmity against God, not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. All right. Moving right along. And that knowing the time, that now is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we, we believed. Now remember, uh, Paul writes over in Ephesians that, the, that basically the, the last part of our salvation is the redemption of our body. And we receive the seal of the Spirit over in Ephesians chapter 1. You go read that. You can see that. The Holy Ghost is our seal that we're going to have a redeemed body. And so the, fulfill, the fulfilling of the complete redemption of our lives is the salvation of our bodies. 
The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us there, listen to this. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Who is the Apostle Paul writing to? He's writing to the church at Rome. He's writing to Christians. Now you listen to some people teach that when you got born again, you automatically do everything that God wants you to do because you're under grace. And Paul said, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. It is, it is such a fallacy that people teach that because you're under grace, you're going to automatically obey the laws of God or the commands of God or what God dictates and requires of people. No, you have to cast off. That you're, you're required to cast off what? The works of darkness. So you got people saying, well, it doesn't matter if I drink, doesn't matter if I get high, doesn't matter if I do this, doesn't matter if I do that. I'm under grace. And that's, that's false teaching. Because Paul says, and, and they call Paul the grace preacher, so here he is, therefore cast off the works of darkness. Now, you can go to Galatians, the fifth chapter, get down there after the fruit of the Spirit, and he says, for the works of the flesh are these, and he goes on and lists a bunch of stuff. And then he says, and, and, and as such like, in other words, things along this line, it's not just limited to those things he lists, anything, that's all those are the works of the flesh or the works of darkness. We're to cast those off. We are not to look some people think, you know, if you just tell people that they're under grace, they're not going to sin. All I have seen by people who do that, get into the excess of that is they, th they think they can get away with it. Now, I'm not saying we do you beat the snot out of you, you know, you dirty, rotten, scoundrel sinners. You, if you don't do exactly right until Jesus comes back, you're going to die and go to hell. The truth of the matter is, as a new creation being, Paul wrote to the new creation church and said, cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Why? Because putting on the armor of light is how we walk free from and, and, and not walk in the works of darkness. What does he mean put on the armor of light? We renew our mind to the word of God. We look into the word of God. We look into the perfect law of liberty, James says. And we see who we are. We see what we have. And we act on what we are to act on. And those we do what the Bible says for us to do. We act like the Bible says for us to act like. The Bible says, be imitators of God as dear children. Well, how are you going to imitate God if you don't know how God acts? Amen. We're to imitate God. See, I understand the positional side of grace, but a lot of people don't understand the actual, the, the reality side or the putting into practice side of grace. They want to know that they're in Christ Jesus, they're seated in heavenly places, they're righteous with God, a lot of, on and on and on and on. And that's powerful teaching, but if you can't take it, and Paul does it consistently in his writings, Ephesians and Galatians are very uh, articulate in the way he did it. The first half of those books are positional truths, who you are in Christ, what you have, the authority, etc. Then the last half of those books are how to put it into practice. And Paul does that all the time in his writings. He might say one minute, you're, you're righteous, and then come right back and say, now put off the works of darkness. In other words, your position empowers you to act out the reality of it in this life. So we are to act out what God says we are. We're to live what God says we're to live. We're not to lay down and say, well, this, I, uh, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm going to heaven anyway. That's not, that's not Bible. That's not what Paul taught. Paul taught that because of these things, you are to do these things. Now, these things don't make you what you are. Jesus Christ made you what you are. But now that you're in Christ, you have to act out and imitate him and be like him and do like him and put off the works of darkness and walk and put on the armor of light and walk as children of the light. That comes from a relationship and a, and a revelation from the Word of God, knowing who you are in Christ and knowing what the Word of God says, but then you're to act it out. And you're not going to automatically act it out. God didn't do that with Adam. He hasn't done it with anybody that's ever walked the earth. Make them do what he wants them to do. He gave them the choice. You know, Joshua, choose you this day, life or death, blessing or cursing. But as for me and my house, we choose life. God's always given us a choice. 
From the very beginning, God made us free moral agents. Now, when I say free, we are free to obey or disobey him. You are free to be associated with the kingdom. And I say this, although we are free-willed spirits, we are not independent spirits of, of, of that, that we can operate in a kingdom of our own. We operate either, either under the kingdom of heaven or under the kingdom of Satan. You must operate in one of those realms. You cannot at, operate independently. You can't go out and do your own thing and say, I don't want Satan and I don't want God. I got my own thing going on. It doesn't work. Man being a free moral spirit and free having a free spirit is still a subordinate spirit in that he has to choose between one of the two. Let me say this. There's two options, nothing else. You don't, you don't get them. just run out and say, you know what? Hey, God, you know, I'm not, I'm not a real hippo in your kingdom. And devil, I don't want to do your thing. So I'm going to go create my own galaxy and live out there and do my thing. Listen, in this case, Frank and Elvis don't get to sing your theme song. I did it my way. Okay, Frankie was, Frankie was the first one, then Elvis did a remake. You know, I did it my way. Anyway, right, anyway. you don't get to do that. You got, you're subordinate to either God's kingdom or Satan's kingdom. You have to follow one of the, one of the two. See, when, uh, how, many, how many know who the first man that was ever born again was? Adam. He was born from life unto death. When he disobeyed God, he, became, he was born of Satan's spirit and became subordinate to Satan's kingdom. How, well, how do you know that? Because Jesus said in John 8, 44, ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will fulfill. When did that happen? In the Garden of Eden. Satan became man's spiritual, spiritual father. When Jesus was raised from the dead and mankind was raised up with him, you know, Jesus is referred to as the first, in the Gospels, he's called the first, uh, first uh, uh, the only begotten son of the father. In the, in the epistles, he's referred to as the first one from the dead, first one born from the dead. Now, I'm going to just mess up your theology. You can't be talking about physical death because there's all kinds of people that were raised from the dead. Even under the ministry of Jesus, several people were raised from the dead. We know that the, the young man coughing when Jesus came to the funeral. We know Lazarus. We know uh, 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 Jairus' daughter. And he told the apostles, I mean the disciples, go out there, preach the gospel, lay hands on the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead. We know there were people all raised to the dead throughout the Old Testament. Elijah raised people from the dead. When he went to the son, boy, laid, put his hands on his hands, laid over him, breathed into, and, and breathed into his mouth, and he, he came alive again. So people all through the Old Testament were raised from the dead. And then Elisha, his, he did third, remember, remember Elisha was supposed to get a double portion of, of the anointing that Elijah had? Well, if you go study it, Elijah did seven major miracles. Elisha did 13. Somebody said, see, he didn't do 14. Oh, wait a second. Because he got the 14th posthumously. That means after he was dead. They were, they were out in the battle one day and ran by and, and, and a young man got killed and they, they didn't have time to bury him because the enemy's in hot pursuit. They just took him and threw him down and it happened to be Elisha's tomb. And he rolled down there and rolled up against his bones and got raised from the dead. Came running out of that thing chasing him. They all took off and I mean, they were probably running faster than they ever ran at that point. Hello? You know? So people were raised from the dead. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, first begotten from the dead. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And um, so we're, not, we're no longer to work the works of darkness, but we're to put on the armor of light. Well, we're to work the works of the kingdom. Ephesians says that um, we are, uh, oh, gracious. We are created in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2.10, unto good works. I get so fed up with people saying that, you know, doing works is a cuss word. You know, for now, to get saved, it ain't, it's not what you do. Jesus is the only way. It's by the grace of God. We come, to, we come to the Father through a grace called the redemptive plan of God, Jesus Christ. But after you're born again, you're to do stuff. And you're to do the works of life. And you're going to have to put, Paul wrote in another place, he said, put off the old man and put on the new, which is created after God in righteousness and true holiness. We're, we're to walk according to the things of God, according to the laws of God, according to the word of God, as children of the light. It doesn't come automatically. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 2, receive with meekness the ingratitude word, which is able to save your... No, that's, that's James. I'm talking about James. Peter says, um, oh, gosh, gosh. Receive with... No, 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 no. Desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow 
thereby. God wants us to grow up. Stop acting like youngins. He wants us to be mature. Amen? Hallelujah. All righty. So here, put off the works of darkness, cast them off, put on the armor of light, let us walk honestly. Here's Paul giving a commandment, walk honestly. As in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and in wantonness, not in strife and envying. Now wait a second here. He said, let us walk a certain way. That sounds like a commandment to me. Amen? Amen? Now, the law of love, much of the law of love refers to your actions toward your neighbor. The other part of it refers to your actions toward God. Amen? But then he tells us here that, you're, that you, how you carry out and how you live and how you conduct yourself. <clears throat> he says here, let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness. You got people going around getting drunk as Christians. They got brew and hymn services now. now I, they just took and had the a Muslim imam go to the National Cathedral and have a prayer service. Can anybody say Ichabod? There was a, there was a child named by somebody's, uh, it's somebody's lineage of the Old Testament. And the name Ichabod meant the glory of the Lord has departed. Ichabod written over the churches. The glory of the Lord has departed. Bringing Muslim prayers into the church. I would say their brain did, but their spirits messed up before their brain ever got involved. Are y'all here? You going home? Now, back in 1980, oh gosh, 81, 82, somewhere in that era, I was in a meeting. Actually, Brother Summerall was at Ramah. I believe he said it at Ramah. And he said that the United States would, you know, back then he was preaching about jihad, the holy war. He had a book out back then. He, you know, he saw all this coming. Well, he, was, he, was, he walked in that pro prophetic realm. And he said this. He said there will come a time and a season that the United States will be under the, uh, under the authority of Islam. You got a bunch of people running around saying that our current president is a Christian. Now, you go judge him according to the Bible, and he's not. And he, the church he went to was not a, a Jeremiah Wright was, was what, we, what we refer to as uh, black liberation theology, which is a branch of Marxist liberation theology out of Central America and brought into America, and, and it's, it's not Christian. Okay. Jesus is, is, is a figure, but he's not, he's not the son of God, and et cetera. And there's a lot of people who've testified and said that our president is, is a Muslim. He was brought up in, under a Muslim father in a Muslim country. All right? He's, he's sympathetic to Muslims, and, and he hates, he, he almost hates the Jews. He's, you, know, listen, you can study his, his stance for Israel. It's not a stand for Israel. If you're not for them, you're in trouble. I would not be for, I'm telling you, you don't, you don't run around and just get against Israel. Well, that's the natural lineage. I'm going to tell you something. I got a friend, Fawaz, the Jordanian Jew bomber. Bro, I think Brother Bill knows Fawaz. Yep. Now, Fawaz is from Jordan. Now, the reason we call him the Jordanian Jew bomber, he's one of my roommates at Ramah. Uh, and it's funny, he came to Ramah, and they wouldn't let him in. He founded Dean Moffat for two weeks. They finally let him in school because he said, I'm supposed to be here. Well, your application was turned down. I'm supposed to be here. But your application was turned down. He hounded him until they let him in. And uh, he said he was, a, as a child, he knew men who fought in the 67 War. I think also referred to it as the Six-Day War. He knew men where, they, where, the, where the tanks came up on the dunes to, to go. They were going to go into Israel. And they were just going to wipe them out. And this man said this. He said, we came up on the dunes. And he said, there were millions of soldiers. Well, Israel's only a nation at this time of about 5 million people. This is 67. Millions of soldiers. Who were they? <laughs> Who do you think they were? Heaven just sent some angels down. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curses thee. The nation that supports Israel is a nation that's blessed. 
Our nation is telling Net uh, Netanyahu off and Bibi off. Our nation is, you know, telling us, telling them to let, to, to let the Muslims do what they're supposed to do. Our nation is supporting the Muslims against Israel. I mean, all kinds of stuff is going on behind the doors. They just went and slaughtered. Look, they just went into a Jewish synagogue and they with uh, with uh, um, cleavers and guns and slew four. Uh, Israelis in the synagogue and then went out and danced in the streets and we tell them to be calm. Now what would happen if somebody walked into a major church in America are you here and slew four people and went out and danced in the street and they were you know, um, you know Iraqis or something. We wouldn't be sitting around going be calm. We'd be looking for blood. They bombed our World Trade Center. We went looking for blood. We went, we went and I said okay <laughs> all right uh, you're not going to do this. Be calm. You don't tell people to be calm when they're getting uh, shot, uh, hammered all the time. We, we are not, and, and, and the stuff that's coming out of our out of our government right now is not, and State Department said is not supportive of Israel. It's not supportive of Israel. We 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 better get some people in there who are. Why? Because as the leader goes, the nation goes. You know what the Old Testament says? This it says this: the people rejoice. When the righteous reign. When the righteous aren't reigning, you don't rejoice. Look at Israel. Remember that was written for our sample? Every time they got a bad leader, they went into captivity and bad stuff started happening. Every time they got a good leader, blessings started coming. Well, that one over big. I'm not saying that we, you know, we curse the president, but at the same time, I mean, uh, I, I believe Lester Summerall's prophecy. I, and I'm, I'm telling you, when I, he, I, he said it, I couldn't figure out how it could have happened. How did it happen? We voted it in. The people of this country voted someone right in. Now, Iman's, uh, four years ago, our president rejected the prayer breakfast for the Christians and went to the Muslim prayer thing. Four or five years ago. Would not go to the Christian one, but went to a Muslim prayer. Did all the rug, did all the stuff, put the little hat on and everything. But see, it's all dressed up. Because the media wants to, wants to, has an agenda. That is to destroy our way of life. But I remember when Brother Summerall said that, you think, how can that be? We're the United States of America. How in the world is some little uh, penny ante country like Iran going to come over here and take over? It wasn't. The Russians used to say during the Cold War, we'll never defeat America from without. We'll just go and do it within. We'll subvert from within. We'll subvert their, we'll get, <laughs> and they're, do, they're trying to get people to put liberal judges in place. Now we've got such liberal judges that, you know, a state passes a, law, a constitutional amendment to their law, and what happened about that homosexual marriage is not permitted, the marriage between man and woman, and some liberal judge just goes, bang, that's unconstitutional, y'all can get married, and there's nothing anybody can do about it because a federal judge said it had to be done. They've been set all over the courts, all over our country. I don't know if you know this or not, but the current Secretary of Defense is a Muslim. A practicing Muslim. He converted to Islam. He would have never got through a conservative Senate, but he got through a liberal one. We, we put a Muslim in, and now home, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I'm really way off of this. Yeah, I'm in, but let's go ahead. I'll finish it up. I will. Home Depot is now going to require all their employees to have sensitivity training for Islam. All their, all their um, uh, supervisor stuff has to take sensitivity training so that they can ha handle all the special requests they get to wear their, 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 their fedoras and their um, barakas and all those weird things. And they get to have their this and, you, and, and all this kind of stuff. Walmart has just now crumbled. And all the beef that's sold there has to be slaughtered to, to, to a halal, halal, whatever, to Sharia law, basically. They have to have an imam there praying over it and slaughtered in a specific way in order to slaughter the meat and send it to their stores. I'm like, I don't even want to buy their meat anymore. It's, it's being slaughtered and being blessed by the Ebon. How many Muslims are in this doggone country? And we're, we're, we're breaking, uh, breaking our back. We're under the, uh, an attack. And they're protesting in the streets now. And Dearborn, Michigan is one of the largest Muslim communities in the country. They have compounds there. 
And they're marching in the streets down with signs saying, Sharia law will be here. You better pray to God it's not. Because under Sharia law, they can, they can uh, rape their daughters. And they can slit the wife of their throat as a honor killing. Are you here? If she were to go in public without her thing on her face, they can kill her because she dishonored her husband or, her father, or, or even her father. Now, we've had two beheadings in the past few months here in America. We want to call it workplace violence. It was Sharia law. It was them carrying out the plan, their plans for the infidels. Remember the guy who killed the woman out in the, uh, Oklahoma? He had converted to Islam in prison. And when he, she did something he didn't like, he cut her head off. Now, they're calling it workplace violence. Why are they calling it workplace violence? Because they don't, because our government does not want people to think that Islam was a bad religion. So they hide it. They got the Fort Hood shooter, the army guy, was a Muslim. Workplace violence. No, he was, he was carrying out, you know, Akbar, he was shouting, Akbar Allah, every time he killed somebody. Praise to Allah. That's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by the way. Muhammad was a pedophile. Go study your history. He was a pedophile. Had young girls as his wife. Wives. How did I get off with all that? I don't know. But it's still true. Anybody have any clue where I got over on that? Well, we'll come back. Let's just jump back here in verse 13. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. The list he says here. But you put on you the Lord Jesus Christ, and oh, I love this, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Now, these people who say they can do anything they want to because they're under grace are making provision to the flesh, and then when you make provision to the flesh, you'll obey it in the lust thereof. To fulfill the lust thereof. God doesn't want you fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Are y'all here? You're going home. He says, don't make provision. Paul wrote in another place, I believe it may be in Galatians or it could be in Colossians. He said this. He said, we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. Your flesh will lead you astray and your flesh will get you messed up. And if you make provision for it, you will obey it and its lust, and you'll get messed up. We may make provision for it. Honey, if you've got HBO paying cable access to get HBO in your house, well, they've got some good series on there. Yeah, and they got a whole lot of rot and filth. Make provision for it, and you'll fulfill the lust of your flesh. Well, I wasn't trying to see it. It just happened to pop across the screen. Don't make provision. Hello? It's like pick going to a store, and, you know, now they have to kind of cover up the, the, the porn. But picking it up and flipping through it and say, oh, I, I, wasn't try, I wasn't going to buy it. Well, you're making provision to your flesh. Hello? You make provision to the flesh, and you will fulfill the lust of your flesh. Y'all, yeah. Y'all hear you gone home. You don't go hang out with pot smokers. Why? You hang around long enough. You, I mean, I won't smoke none myself. Yeah, but secondhand get you high too. Next thing you know, you get, you'll get enough of a buzz off the secondhand, you want your own. You, make a provi you cannot make provision to the flesh. Why? You will fulfill the lust. So these people who think they can commit adultery, they can drink, they can do all these kinds. And I'm going to tell you, drinking, you go drink your wine, go drink your beer, go drink this, go drink that. You're making provision to the flesh. Well, I didn't mean to get drunk, I just, and I didn't know my limit. I'll tell you your limit, zero. You don't have any, you can't get drunk. I keep some in the house for medicinal purposes. How do, you, how do you fix stupid? 
You renew your mind to the word of God. Because uh, my mama always says, stupid is, stupid does. Forest! All right. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. There's a lot of people who refuse to put on Jesus because they want to make a provision for the flesh and then blame it on they couldn't help themselves. Can I say this? That ship don't float. Now, you can figure that out. That ship don't float. <laughs> it sinks. You go around and start making provision for the flesh and not putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then you give heed to the lust of the flesh, and you're going to go around and say, I just couldn't help myself. Yes, you could. The Bible tells you how to. Put on Jesus Christ and don't make provision to the flesh. The Bible says, listen, Jesus ate with the publicans and sinners as a ministry. He didn't hang out with them for fellowship. The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. In other words, you go minister to the world, but you don't hang with the world. I was reading a really good article today on, from Charisma Magazine on why is it that there's so much sin in the church. And it was this. The, the, um, the premise is that the gospel is for everybody. Amen. The gospel is for everybody. But in the church, you can't, the, the church is for the Christian. Amen? I said the church is for the Christian. Glory to God. Amen? All right. Let's finish. We're done. Hallelujah. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.